Okay, I'm going to try to go really quickly through the four hypersensitivity uh, types and explain what they are, and then there's going to be a little quiz at the end. I suggest before I go through that that you uh, get on the uh, internet and watch this YouTube video. It's the Help Hippo uh, Hypersensitivity. It's a quick uh, minute and 50 second video with mnemonics to uh, kind of nail down the big idea of the four different types. So first the type 1 hypersensitivity, it's essentially what we call allergies. So first what we have is an antigen presenting cell. And the antigen presenting cell picks up a whole bunch of antigens. Antigen presenting cell takes that over to the T helper cell. And the T helper cell is activated. Then along comes the B cell. The T helper cell then takes the antigens and presents them to the B cell and says, make antibodies against these. This causes the B cell to change into a plasma cell. The plasma cell then starts producing antibodies. Now typically, in a normal reaction, the, the plasma cell would start by making IgM and then IgG antibodies. However, in an allergic reaction, for whatever reason, through uh, many proposed mechanisms, the plasma cell makes IgE. This is no problem on the first exposure, but after the first exposure, the, Ig, the IgE antibodies will bind to mast cells. And mast cells, as we know, have a bunch of uh, things called granules. So we have granules inside of our mast cell. The next time that the antigen is present, it will bind to the antibodies in the mast cell, causing degranulation, and degranulation means that these granules are going to spit out histamines and other inflammatory cytokines. The treatment for type 1 hypersensitivity uh, is any of or combination of the epinephrine, antihistamines, and corticosteroids. And one way to think about these is you think allergic skin rash, you put on some cortisol, cortisone uh, with, uh, with some type of hay fever allergy, you take Benadryl. And with um, something that's causing an allergic uh, a asthma attack, uh, you can take perhaps epinephrine. And epinephrine would be also for systemic type stuff. In type 2 hypersensitivity, what you're going to have is a normal cell. And so here's my red blood cell. And there's a couple of different ways that that normal cell can get an antigen on its surface. So on the surface of my normal cell, I have an antigen. How did it get there? First possibility is that this, it's a normal component of the cell and that your body just accidentally started creating antibodies against it. And so that would be an autoimmune process. The second possibility is that this thing got attached from somewhere else. Something that does this uh, and is well known for it would be penicillin. Penicillins bind readily to red blood cells and sometimes uh, various people have antibodies already built up against penicillin. So that would be an extrinsic possibility. With the type 2 hypersensitivity, the thing you want to remember is that the regular antibodies, IgM uh, and IgG, are being uh, used, and it's mediating attack against the cell, and the, norm the classic complement pathway is uh, being utilized to opsonize the cell. This is going to be different from type 1, which uses IgE, and it's going to be different from the other two types as well, especially type 4, which uses uh, a cell versus a cell rather than antibodies. Two uh, common examples would be like hemolytic anemia and penicillin binding to red blood cells like I just pointed out. A few other things would include myasthenia gravis, Graves' disease, good pastures, and acute uh, acute organ transplant rejection. Uh, chronic tr uh, organ transplant rejection is going to be a type 4. Now I want to be upfront with type 3. Uh, I read a couple of different sources and they seem to indicate different things. However, the gist of it was this. 
Imagine that I only have three antibodies. However, I have a lot of antigen. In fact, I have excess antigen. The body usually likes to uh, activate the complement pathway when you have multiple antibodies bound to one antigen. So if this antigen had three antibodies attached to it, then the complement cascade would be activated. However, when there's way more antigen than there are antibodies, then what you get are these small immune complexes that cannot be uh, immediately activated and complement and they're going to be they have to be small because they have to be soluble able to move in the bloodstream so what happens to those is they they usually get deposited in, in places within the body the main place for deposits is going to be uh, one is going to be the kidney creating a glomerulonephritis Two is going to be the joints, creating an arthritis. And three is going to be the vasculature, especially the microvasculature. They can be in other places as well, but these are the three most common. Once those deposits go into the joints, kidney, or vasculature, eventually complement will be activated and inflammation will take place locally uh, where the deposits are made. So you get the inflammation of the glomerulus, the inflammation of the joints, and so on. Now, lupus is, is indicated in a couple of different types of hypersensitivity. It's also, uh, so type 3 being one of those. Um, and I don't know exactly what the, uh, the antigen is in that. Um, I'm guessing it's the nucleus or double-stranded DNA. However, don't quote me. Another thing would be the post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. Uh, you can get reactive arthritis, serum sickness. Uh, there's something called the Arthus reaction, and you may be familiar with it if you watched the Help Hippo video that I uh, pointed out at the beginning of this. And just like I said, the, the process, the three main processes for type 3 are necrotizing vasculitis, glomerulonephritis, and arthritis. Now what sets this apart from type 2 and type 1? Okay, so again, this is different from type 1 because it's not using IgE. It is using IgG and IgM. So in that way, it's much like type 2. It's different than type 2, however, because it's small immune complexes. In type 2, we had cells, which are large. If, if a, an antibody in a cell bind, it's automatically a large immune complex. Uh, so type 2 is cells. Type 3 is small. And the other thing about type 3 is typically there's more antigen, more antigen, than antibody. So the antibody gets overwhelmed and can't make the can't activate the complement cascade. I was thinking about trying to draw this out for you, but it's going to take me a little bit longer and it'll make the video longer if I do. So I'm just going to go through the steps. Now type 4 is delayed and it's delayed because it's not mediated by antibodies. So all of the other types use antibodies. This is going to be cell mediated. So what happens is first, just like in uh, every other time, the macrophage is going to present an antigen to the CD4 T cell on the MH, uh, cla MHC class 2 and at that time the macrophage will start uh, secreting interleukin 12. This stimulates the proliferation of the T cell and then the T cell will secrete interleukin 2 and interfere on gamma. This, uh, uh, this induces the T cell, the, the helper cells, to release cytokines. Cytokines mediate response, which includes activating a cytotoxic T cell, and then the activated cytotoxic T cell will destroy the cell or the specific target, i.e. the antigen. Macrophages get involved as well, so the activated macrophages will release hydrolytic enzymes, and then the activated macrophages, uh, in some cases, can have intracellular pa uh, pathogens that transform them into giant cells, and I think this is particularly the case with uh, tuberculosis. 
Now, you, you'd say, oh, this all sounds normal. However, the thing that makes it abnormal is that it's your one cell attacking another cell. So the, the antigen is one of your cells. And it may be a protein, it may be some, some kind of marker on your cell, but it is your cell that's getting killed in, in this case. So the thing to remember with type 4 is that it's cell-mediated, cell-mediated, and your cells are destroyed. So cells attack cells, and it's your cells attacking themselves. So a couple of diseases associated with it, so type 1 diabetes, the, the pancreatic beta cells um, are are being attacked and it uh, could be one of the cellular uh, proteins, it could be insulin itself, it could be glutamate carboxylase, a bunch of different theories on what is uh, being, uh, what is the antigen in this case and it could be that all three of those are true just in different people. In multiple sclerosis, myelin basic protein is the antigen and it causes the, um, the body to attack the oligodendrocyte. Now, I took a lot of this stuff straight from uh, reputable sources. Uh, so whenever I saw rheumatoid arthritis on this list, it kind of took me for a surprise because we were talking about what rheumatoid factor was uh, the other day. And rheumatoid factor is an antibody attacking an antibody rather than um, a cell attacking a cell. But this says that in rheumatoid arthritis, so RA may fall under multiple types of hypersensitivity. That's what I'm thinking right at this moment, but I'm not sure of. Uh, but in this case, it's an antigen uh, in the synovial membrane that's getting attacked by the uh, cytotoxic T cells in the macrophages. So another one, Crohn's disease, Hashimoto's. What I thought was really cool, the MAN2 turbocillin test is based on type 4 hypersensitivity. Celiac is another uh, big thing, and then graft versus host disease. In the United Kingdom, they have a type 5 hypersensitivity. It's not really used in the U.S., but it's just a variant of type 2. And so the myasthenia gravis and Graves' disease, we would call it type 2 in the U.S. They call it type 5 in the U.K. Question number one, what class of antibodies is implicated in type 1 hypersensitivity? You get three seconds. The answer is IgE. What are the three pharmacological treatments for an allergic reaction? Take your time. Take your time. Time's up. Epinephrine, antihistamine, and corticosteroids. Type 2 hypersensitivity. Name two ways antigens can be present on the surface of a self-cell. I.e., how can an antigen be present on the surface of a red blood cell? The answer is it can be intrinsically or extrinsically, i.e. the body accidentally creates an antibody against it or it gets attached, like in penicillin. I didn't cover this, but I think we probably know the answer. Type 2 hypersensitivity, what test or tests would you perform to determine if a type 2 hypersensitivity was attacking red blood cells? Think about it. You know this. You think about it. That's right, the direct and indirect Coombs test. An autoimmune hemolytic anemia? You got this. Type 3 hypersensitivity. Name three places that are primarily implicated in a type 3 hypersensitivity. Three places in the body. The first one is. The second one is. And the last one. You guys are all wrong. It's the joints, kidneys, and vessels. Name an autoimmune disease that is considered to be a primary factor in type 3 hypersensitivity. If you remember right, I said, I have no idea how this works, and I still don't, but I know what the answer is. You guys are good. It's lupus. Rhymes with poopus. What bodily components mediate type 4 hypersensitivities? And I really couldn't think of how to ask this question, but by components I mean, besides an antibody, what mediates a type 4 hypersensitivity? I think I gave that one away. You guys are right, it's the cells, rather than the antibodies. Alright guys, four questions in one. This is the last one. What type of autoimmune, what type of hypersensitivity is it? Crohn's disease? hemolytic anemia, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, and hay fever. 
I'll give you a second. I'll give you a little bit longer on this one. I'm going to stop talking now. Just think about it. Okay, it's hard to stop talking. But it's been 28 seconds. After those 30 agonizing seconds, I hope you figured out that it's type 4, type 2, type 3, and type 1.